So first, I got to ask, how's your wife? She's great. She had, she told me to ask how you are. <laughs> good, good. I mean, I, I'm a little biased. She's my favorite Purdue, but <laughs> well, that's easy. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> so you know, you heard Grover and we were just talking about taxation and tax reform, and you guys were able to do some great tax reform in Washington that has really stimulated the economy. And given your business background, I wanted to start first with the economy because we saw the Fed the other day lower rates for the first time in a while, generated some headlines. Uh, markets are a little bit nervous about the president's tariffs. So how do you see the lay of the land economically right now? Well, first of all, Eric, I'd like to welcome all of you from not from Georgia to Georgia, the best state in the country in which to do business. Yeah, there are some uh, Texans who are, you better watch out. <laughs> um, we have the best economic turnaround. I call it a turnaround, not a renaissance or anything else. Uh, this is a turnaround. We were headed in the wrong direction. In my estimate, and I've looked at this, this is the best economic turnaround in U.S. history. I was in the White House two weeks after President Trump was inaugurated, and his mission there was to talk about uh, what our agenda would be the first two years. And he said, look, we have to, job one is to grow the economy. And so he said, what are we going to do that? We agreed that we would work on regulation, energy, taxes, and Dodd-Frank. And we knocked all of those out of the park, frankly. And because of that, consumer confidence went up, CEO confidence went up, Capital formation really took off after a decade of sitting on its backside, if you will, and we really did kickstart this economy. So we produced six million new jobs in the last two years. We have the lowest unemployment in 50 years, the lowest African American, Asian, and Hispanic unemployment ever measured. We have the highest middle class income right now. And yet, when I hear Democrats talk about, well, this is all due to the Obama fiscal policy, <laughs> right. I go bananas. Uh, just get me, just tee that one up and then wait four hours. I'll be through talking about four <laughs> hours later. Uh, I just love for a Democrat to try to tell me that they're, they're the fiscally responsible group and that they got this thing started. They were doing everything they could to kill the economy. Well, in, in that regard, on the fiscal responsibility, I know you guys are having to deal with a very tough budget issue. Yep. We're going to have potentially a trillion dollar deficit. The debt keeps going up. Yep it doesn't seem like there's any movement to deal with this, and the Democrats are stuck on raise taxes, raise taxes. Yep. Is there anything that on the executive side can do? Is there anything to start dealing with this issue? Yeah, let me, let me put it in perspective. You know, we have $22 trillion of debt. Over the next 30 years, we have $130 trillion of liabilities already committed to by career politicians over the last 50 years. Now, put that in perspective, that's $1 million per household in America. This is why I ran. I, I'd never run for anything. This is why I ran for the United States Senate. And growing the economy is one of five things you can do to address that. But the 800-pound gorilla I'll get to in a minute, but there are five things you have to do. President Trump understands this. Uh, when he was running, I asked him about the debt and uh, would he be focused on these? He said, absolutely, we've got to do some things first. We have to get the confidence of the country back. Remember where we were. We had a president telling us that 2% is a new norm in terms of economic growth. Oh, we're just going to be another member of the community of nations. We won't be the shining city on the hill anymore. We're not going to be the colonialist country that his father described us as. We're going to be just another member. So in comes Trump, and what we are doing now is working on five things, three of which are already underway to deal with a long-term debt crisis. One is grow the economy. The CBO, Congressional Budget Office, says if you grow the econ economy 100 basis points more than you did under Obama, and we're more than doing that right now, you lower the debt curve by $3 trillion over a decade. Now, that's fine, but that's only about a third of the problem. So you can't grow your way out of here. And contrary to what the Democrats say, you can't tax your way out of here. The second thing we have to do is we have to fix this budget process. And some of you have heard me talk about this. And I'm sorry, this is about the stage where my wife says that I can bring any cocktail party to its knees talking about this. Um, <laughs> But the second thing is you have to fix this broken budget process. In 74, Congress has only funded the government on time four times. Imagine if you were to do that and went to your banker and, and said everything is fine four times. And the only reason we can do that is because we're the reserve currency and we can still borrow money. The third thing you have to do is get rid of redundant agencies. We now have the first, thanks to Donald Trump, we have the first ever DOD audit. Department of Defense has now, for the first time, even though in 91, Congress passed a law that said a president was supposed to supply to Congress a, an audit of the Defense Department, the third largest line item on the, on the sheet, nobody had ever done it. So I went to President Trump and said, do you realize we have a law? He says, well, why don't we have a, a budget, I mean, a, an audit? And I said, well, they say it's too large, too expensive, too complicated. 
And I reminded them it's only a little bit, DOD is only a little bit larger than Walmart. Can you imagine if Walmart called Congress and said, oh, I'm not going to give you the numbers this quarter? <laughs> so it's just nonsense. So he said, well, yeah, we're going to have an audit. One year later to the day almost, we have our first audit. The fourth thing you have to do, and thank you. Look, I, I can't defend all of his tweets, but I'll tell you this. This man is driving for results, and that's where I came from. And most of you live in that world right now, in the real world. The third thing, the fourth thing we have to do, and this is the biggest one, Eric, and you've talked about this all the time. I do, too. And that is, if you don't save Social Security and Medicare, this thing just gets unwound around our ears. It really does. And the last thing is medical costs. We've wasted a decade talking about insurance and not the real drivers of health care costs. So three of those five things we're already working on to try to get this curve down. Now, the lie of the, of the decade, maybe the century, is the Democrats say, yeah, but the Republicans don't care about the debt. I'm the biggest debt hawk in Congress that I can see, and I've got a, I'm the only one that I know of that has a debt clock in my office. I watch this thing spin every day to make myself, remi remind myself of how fast this is going. It's like $100,000 a second, y'all. I mean, this thing is outrageous. But it reminds me of the focus that we've got to have on doing this. And a lot of the Democrats said, well, this tax bill raised spending $1.7 trillion. Well, Congressional Budget Office said that, but they also said two other things. They said if you grow the economy four-tenths of 1% more, it more than pays for it. Well, guess what? We're way over that. And then it said if you, if you increase growth by 100 basis points, just one percentage point, it lowers the debt curve $3 trillion over a decade. And that's, all three of those things are true, but they never tell you the last two. So this is the number one threat to our national security, our economic wherewithal, and the future of our kids and our kids' kids going forward is the debt problem. You mentioned medical costs. It is constantly fascinating to me, and I mentioned this yesterday, that it was progressives who were attacking some of the Democrats on stage this past week saying, you keep bashing insurance companies and they're only maximum 5% of the costs dealing with medical. And I actually had no idea because they talk about it so much, I assumed it was much higher than that. Um, I mean, the overall medical costs in this country, it's, it's, so it's not the insurance companies, it's the other issues. And meanwhile, they want to blow up pharmaceutical companies and, and everything else. Well, they've already blown up the insurance industries. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's for sure. We wasted a decade because of Obamacare. But you mentioned a word I want to I rail against just a second. Progressives. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like a really good word, doesn't it? Oh, I'm progressive. I'm thinking ahead of you. I'm, I have a new well, way of thinking. they can't liberal anymore. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not liberal. <laughs> it's progressive. But let me tell you a little history on that. Where did that word come from? In the first decade of the 19th century is where that word came from, when they said, oh, we're, our abundance is all fulfilling, I and mean, we're, we're the most affluent country in the history of the world. We've got all this we can do. We're going to have a new way of thinking. The government's going to come in and take charge, and everything's going to be fine. In 1913, they changed the Senate from being appointed by the state houses to be elected. I personally agreed with that, by the way, because I'd have never been appointed by a state legislature to be in the United States Senate. <laughs> uh, it took you all to get me here, so um, thank you. Um, but over the last 100 years, Eric, the progressives have been the dominant leaders in thought and in politics. The Democrats have had four political supermajorities in that 100 years. Four. Guess how many Demo or Republicans have had? Zero. We've been the minority party because we play defense. We're, we're defensive on our conservative values. But right now, we've got a president that's fighting for us. We have told the world what we believe in. We've actually executed most of it. And now we have the results to prove it. And yet we're still bashful about it. And I'm here to tell you that those four Democratic supermajorities gave us the New Deal, the Great Society, Dodd-Frank, and Obamacare. And I'm just a business guy, but I can put it at the feet of those supermajorities and those big sweeping bills that brought us bigger government, most of the responsibility for this $22 trillion calamity we have right now. And the irony of all that is they fail the people they claim to champion. Democrats say all the time, well, we're the champion of the little guy, the working men and women of America. Nonsense. They believe in one thing, democratic power. That's what this is all about. Now they're talking about, oh, we want a single uh, party government. We want a socialist agenda. We're so affluent, we want to share it with the world, and they have no idea what built this economic miracle. I'm telling you, innovation, capital formation, and the rule of law, and on the back of the best workforce in the history of the world, created this economic miracle in the last 75 years. And it angers me that these people are so superior and so um, egalitarianism, I guess, that they believe that we can now tinker with the fundamentals that created this economic miracle.
democracy and capitalism. I had a great question, but I lost it when you said that. So <laughs> I, I got to move into a different area. Well, I'm sorry. Area. I mean, no, I, just, no, it, I get it, emotional. It I mean, why do point. this if you're not going to be passionate, right? Why are you here? Right. This is the future of our country. Eric, thank you so much for doing this. And Eric and I have always been on the same plane on, on these issues. I mean, th this is not about whether he and I might disagree on this or that. It's who are we standing up against. We're not fighting each other. This is the fight of our generation, folks. I mean, I, I can't say it any stronger. He says it in his editorials. When he goes on Russia's program, he says it. Uh, this is about the future for our children and our children's children, which is exactly what Reagan warned us about when he said that freedom is only one generation away from extinction. You know? I remember what I wanted to ask you, because <laughs> you mentioned it uh, in that, and it, it sounds very wonky, but I know the president, and you in particular, and, and the Congress, when the Republicans had both houses, work to curb Dodd-Frank, which I view as a piece of legislation that helped chase a ton of capital to Europe and out of the United oh, States absolutely. through onerous regulation. And I know it goes over a lot of people's heads, uh, but first, thank you for your leadership on that. And, and two, if you could talk about how some of these policies that have been put in place by the Obama administration that are being rolled back really did chase capital to other countries. Oh. What, what happened under President Obama is that they, they really wanted the central government to control capital. If you can control capital and then insurance and then education, guess what? Who's in control? The government. The founders, the mothers and fathers that we had 230 years ago, that's what they were running away from. And that's what they built all these rules to protect against. And so, you know, what I see going on right now is that Obama had pulled back, he had, he had caused $6 trillion to go on the sidelines of capital. There was $2 trillion on the Russell 1000 balance. These are the largest companies because of overregulation and uncertainty coming out of Washington. The second thing is they had $2 trillion on the balance sheets of community banks and small regional banks because of Dodd-Frank, as you just mentioned. And then we had this crazy repatriation law that we hadn't gotten rid of, and there were some $3 trillion plus uh, overseas in unrepatriated U.S. property. That's $6 trillion of equity that was not working in the $20 trillion economy. Well, that's nuts. So what President Trump did, being a business guy, wanting to get results, is we removed the uncertainty. We've, I think now it's over 2,000 regulations have been reversed. Uh, you know, we passed that tax bill that freed up uh, the money to come back from overseas. CBO says last year alone we brought back a trillion dollars in uh, prior and un un unrepatriated U.S. profits. And I think the biggest thing that we did, believe it or not, as part of this tax bill, was we were, or part of the, the overall plan that we had in addition to the tax bill, was in a bipartisan way, with Republican leadership, we, I think, repealed the most onerous parts of Dodd-Frank. Small community banks had nothing to do with the 08 and 09 financial crisis. They just didn't. They didn't deal with things that, that caused that crisis. And yet Dodd-Frank just crushed them because they had to have capital reserves in excess of what they really needed. They couldn't do some things they needed to do. So we repealed that and freed that back. And you go to small towns right now, my hometown, right here two hours south here, and watch, what, look at what the local banks are doing. They're back in the home mortgage business, they're back in the car lending business, and they're making money again. So I think in, in re-establishing uh, re the economic wherewithal in local communities, that had as much to do with the turnaround as anything I can see. I want to shift actually to those local communities. I know you'll be on the ballot in 2020, and everyone always wants to talk about national politics, but let's talk about you as a senator for Georgia, and what do you see as your big issues for Georgia? Well, agriculture is over half of our economy. We've got two great infrastructure uh, uh, you know, things here in, in Georgia. We have the Atlanta Hartsville Airport right now, uh, the biggest, busiest airport in the world. And we have the Savannah Port, the fourth largest port in the world, the, or in the country, the fastest growing port, the only one that exports more than imports. So we've got the fundamentals. And truly, this is the sixth year in a row Georgia's been established as the, rated the, the best place in the country to do business. That didn't happen by Take accident. Take that, Texas. Yeah, we didn't. Yeah. <laughs> now, you said that, not me. <laughs> I lived in Texas, y'all. I have to be a little careful with that. Uh, but no, seriously, I, I think that there are some limiters right now to Georgia, and that is labor and infrastructure. And that's true of the country. Lee Kuan Yew, who was the prime minister of Singapore, said in growing an economy, and he's the architect of the China resurgence. He really is. Um, he said there are four simple things that you have to have. One is you have to have clean, potable water. Singapore has none. They had to bring it in from Malaysia. We have a problem with that in Georgia right now. Texas has somewhat of a problem. 
uh, with that. Colorado, others have, 13 states really have water problems right now, but Georgia has a little bit of a problem there. Second, you have to have cheap power. Georgia has the cheap power, cheapest power in the country. The third, you have to have an educated and trained workforce, and that's one of our problems right now. The fourth is you have to have world-class infrastructure. So um, the limiters right now in Georgia are labor for our ag communities, our construction. We're growing like crazy here in Georgia. Welcome, come on, by, come on down, um, or come back to see us, as they used to say. But I am absolutely convinced this is going to continue because we've got the right political leadership in the state that understands uh, capital formation, the rule of law, how to, how to breed innovation. Atlanta's becoming a hub for technology innovation, too, which is a very exciting part of our growth. So what's your relationship like with Governor Abrams? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Governor Kemp. <laughs> well, before you said Kemp, my answer would have been who? <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I come from a world like you do. You have to kind of earn your way up. Mm -hmm. You know, it's fine to aspire to things, but you kind of have to work your way there. Kind of got to win an election. Yeah, I mean, think about it. Business, the art community, medicine, sports, the military. I mean, how many idiot four-star generals do you ever see, really? I mean, these people have proven that they can get there. You all live in the real world. To get to where you are, you have to produce. And so it's, it's kind of ironic. Um, I think we've got a great governor. We had a wake-up call in this race, in the governor's race. Uh, the Democrats rolled out. Um, a new model in Texas and in Georgia. Carl Rove is standing up against that in, in Texas and helping in John Cornyn's race right now. But that Ted Cruz race was a lot closer than it should have been, and Brian Kemp's race was a lot closer than it should have been. But they rolled out in Georgia 800 paid employees on the ground. That's never been done before. Um, and so they made it less about the candidate and less about the issues and more about the physical ability to go out and register new voters and, and harvest those new voters. To some degree, I, I think for 2020, I realize it's still a ways away, but it, I'm, maybe I shouldn't be shocked, but I think the Democrats might have taken some of the wrong lessons from 2018 in Georgia, where they've decided they're just going to run to the left. And there is this real mad dash right now among the Democrats in the race against you to be as far left as possible. Um, you, you have the moderate mayor of former mayor of Columbus, Georgia, who now wants everybody to know she's more progressive than the guy who grew, <laughs> literally grew a resistance beard. I didn't even know that was such a thing. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, they're just, they're out there scrambling and, and you seem to be getting results while they just seem to be getting enraged. Well, they can't argue the issues. And, and first of all, it really doesn't matter who they decide will be their uh, second tier candidate, if they will. Uh, it really doesn't matter because they're going to make it less about the issues and less about the candidate and more about their ability to, to, to go get the votes. But they misread 2018 in a big way. And I think this applies to President Trump's race in 2020 as well. When you're electing an incumbent, I think most people, common sense people, forget about whether they're in a Democratic Party, Republican Party, whatever. They kind of look at the person in, in the office and say, did they do what they said they were going to do? President Trump checks every box. And the thing that I'm proud of is that he does. I mean, he, he checks every box. Look, I, I can tell you, he, he drives for results. He calls me late at night, early in the morning. I mean, I don't know when the man sleeps. I mean, really. Uh, but he wants results. And you can see it in some of the compromises that he did. Look, he's pushed us. He's stretched us in the last two years. But look at the results he's doing or getting. He's called out and stood up to NATO, you know, and called out that our allies are not paying their fair share. Well, how many presidents have stood up to China in the last 40 years, for goodness sake? How many have delivered a new USMCA? I mean, I can do this all day. So I think the, the, the political landscape for 2020 is going to be very interesting. The Democrats have decided that they believe what Hillary Clinton said when she lost in 2016. She said, I lost because I didn't go far enough left. But let's remember, they believe that we need a single-party government they believe we need bigger central government. They want a social democracy, but it's even more than that. You can look at this socialized medicine plan they have, combine that with the Green New Deal. There is physically no way you can pay for both of those together. There's physically no way. Let me give you an example. The Green New Deal is $9 trillion, best estimate I can find per year. Per year, $9 trillion. To put, put that in perspective, we only collect $2 trillion in, in uh, income tax. So we collect nine, uh, we, that, the Green New Deal would be $9 trillion. The adjusted gross income of America, all in, total, is $9 trillion. 
every dime of earned salary and income that we have as America would go to the, quote, Green New Deal. I mean, it's outrageous. They, they don't even think about what they're saying. Now they're manufacturing candidates like Cortez and others that didn't come through the crucible of performance in that performance pyramid I talk about. And now they think they can do it with arbitrary mechanisms such as harvesting votes and uh, registering illegals. They want illegals to vote. They want felons to vote. Uh, and there's no surprise why, right? Uh, because they think they can become the dominant party and move to a one-party system. You just have to read what they say. I think, you know, Patton got it right. I read your book. You, you know, you remember that <laughs> quote, right? Um, you have My to listen to what movie. they're saying. And what they're saying is they want, Kamal Harris wants to do away with the Electoral College. You know, Schumer wants Puerto Rico, and I heard this argument the other day on the floor of the Senate. He wants D.C. and Puerto Rico to become two new states. They want new, more seats on the Supreme Court. I don't think they'll find a balanced person like Gorsuch or um, uh, Kavanaugh, you know, they're going to load it up with their side, right? Um, so these are very strong indications that what they want is a single party system that we know failed in Russia in 1917, Germany in 1933, Cuba in 1959, and Venezuela later in the, in the 20th century. We know all these things they're trying to perpetrate right now have failed. Why are they doing it? Because they can promise something to the electorate, get elected, move to a single party system, and then the future of America is really in doubt. Last question for you here. We've been asking the crowd they can submit questions. One I really want to ask you, and I know you touched on a little bit earlier, is, is a lady named Brenda who lives in Savannah wanted to just, one, thank you for your support of the port, and two, uh, see if you could explain a little more the, the national importance of what the Savannah port means and oh, wow. where we're going to go from there with it. Well, having been on that port authority uh, back when I was in business, uh, I, I'm in it with, with the power of that port. Uh, but we tried for 20 years to deepen that port five feet. Let me, I'm sorry, I always do this. Five feet. 20 years we tried to get permission to deepen the port five feet to handle these large post panamax ships that would lower shipping costs by over 50% in many cases. This port right here reaches something like 80% of America's consumptive power better than any other port in the country. That's true. It also has the best productivity of any port in the country. It's the fastest growing port for that reason. They're gonna double their container traffic in the next five years, now listen to this, with no state, no federal money, from cash flow. Wow, I did not know that. I had no idea. It's a powerful asset that America has, and it's a model for other ports, and there are other ports doing that too. And President Trump gets the credit because he broke that log jam Two years ago, when I presented to him, when he talked about infrastructure, we were, in the second year, we were supposed to talk about immigration, trade, and infrastructure, and that's what we've been doing. And I gave him a, a, a clue that he already had some key projects in America that, that all he had to do was just do the funding. So for the third year in a row, President Trump has made sure that the Port of Savannah got funded, and oh, by the way, now is looking at completion. And I can't tell you what that will do for the economy, not only of Georgia, but of the entire eastern side of the United States. Senator, I, I, could, I honestly I could sit here all day with you. <laughs> Don't have the time, and, I, and thank you for being generous with your time. No, it's a thank you so much. Anything thank we can do to help you in 2020?